This is the Indian Nest podcast, stories of success from leaders and change makers of Indian origin. Why have Indians achieved success across so many different disciplines around the globe? I have no idea, but let's find out together because every story is unique. I'm very excited to have Manish Goyal with us today. He's the CEO of Mayo Clinic platform with the Mayo Clinic. He's also been at C-level roles at many companies. I invited him on this show as I was fascinated by his journey from a graduate degree in electrical engineering to becoming CEO of one of the most prestigious medical institutions in the world. Welcome, Manish. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on our podcast. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Sanjay. Wonderful. Uh, Manish, in our podcast, you know, uh, we try to capture the journey of our change makers to so that others get inspired. And in order to obviously capture the journey, uh, we like to go right to the beginning. So can you please uh, take our listeners and viewers to where you were born and just tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so actually, I was born in in, in uh, a small part of India, just south of Jaipur, so uh, the state of Rajasthan, in a, in a city called Ajmer. Um, so I was born there. I was eight uh, when we left the country, and it's a fascinating uh, tale of how um, my family ended up here, uh, at least in our in our own history, right under um, and. Uh, and if you don't know anything about Ajmer, it's an interesting part of the world. And Rajasthan itself is an interesting part of the world. It's sort of captured or captive in time. So when you go there, it feels like going to old India. Um, it's evolving, but ever so slowly. Um, lots of forts, lots of colorful uh, food, lots of colorful attire. Um, and Ajmer itself is interesting because it was a stopping off point for a lot of hippies in the 60s on mm. their way to a part of um, uh, sort of a lake or a mountaintop called Pushkar. And, uh, and so we got a lot of interesting influence from Western parts of the world. And the other fact of Ajmer is it's a fairly blended city, a uh, large number of Hindus, large number of um, Muslim, uh, and large number of um uh, Sindhi, Sindhis as well. So it's an interesting, you know, um, microcosm where people have lived mostly uh, peacefully throughout history. So it kind of gives me a sense of pride when I think about that. That's where I'm from. Yeah. Uh, also famous for the Mayo College and several other things too, right, Manish? Yeah. yeah. No, that's exactly right. Um, an unaffiliated Mayo College. Unaffiliated in Mayo College. Uh, so you were born in uh, Ajmer, right, uh, Manish? Yeah, so uh, I was born there. Um, uh, I have two siblings. I've got two younger brothers, um, four years younger and six years younger. So in many ways, um, I broke the mold, broke, you know, broke all the rules. So my brothers uh, didn't have to uh, uh, bend with that. Um, and all three of us were born in born in Ajmer. Wonderful. Tell us a little bit about the parents, mom and dad, uh, Manish. So uh, mom uh, passed away 20 years ago, but um, growing up, she, um, thanks, the, growing up, she um, was a homemaker, um, you know, high school education. My father um, was getting his electrical engineering degree at a fairly decent school in, in Ajmer. As you said, there's a couple of different um, uh, great post-secondary as well as uh, colleges in, in Ajmer. Um, and my grandfather ran a business, um, uh, a sewing machine repair shop and a fan repair shop. And his business was starting to, um, you know, this was the, I would say, 70s, 1970s. Um, it was starting to um, get into troubled times. And so my father quit his degree and to support the business. Um, and even then that didn't help. So, um, you know, he 
basically didn't have a completed degree and um, and this sort of failed family business that um, required us to think about sort of alternative locations and alternative lifestyles. Um, it's a little bit of a prelude as to why we're here. So uh, Manish, just want to kind of address that. Grandfather was in the sewing machine repairs. Let's say singer, singer machines generally at that time. Yep, uh, I've seen at that time it used, I don't know, maybe in your time, hand, uh, initially it used to be the hand stuff and then with the foot, the foot feet stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, but then the business, because maybe of automation and stuff like that, uh, and dad left uh, his engineering degree to join uh, that and the business kind of didn't work out. How old were you at that time, Manish? I was probably four or five at the time. Um, so this is where, you know, um, it's more offhand, secondhand information from my conversations with my parents and my grandparents. Um, but I was probably four or five years old. So you don't have direct memory of that traumatic time, right? So uh, when the business didn't do well, what did dad do, uh, Manish? Yeah, so um, when I was six, so this would be um, late 70s, uh, my father, um, so my I had a, uh, an aunt, a bua, so my father's sister, um, who had uh, immigrated to the U.S., um, was living um, in, in the Boston area. Um, you know, my father did what a lot of uh, families did at the time, looked for uh, better pastures. And uh, he came to the U.S. Uh, when I was six, uh, looking to establish a, a better life, potentially send money back to support um, uh, that, that family. Interestingly, my father was the only boy uh, of a family of six people. And so a lot of sisters and, you know, when in, in our culture, um, that meant he has a, he had a lot of responsibility. Um, and, uh, and he had a sister that was, um, uh, not yet married as well. So that created additional pressure as you can imagine. Um, but so he, uh, again, when I was six, he immigrated to the, to the U S to establish a foundation of sorts, not a foundation in the traditional, in the legal sense, but a, a sort of a something for him to build a family in the U.S. Um, so the, you know, interesting parts of that, that journey are um, without a degree, um, he had to rely upon, you know, uh, sort of manual labor type jobs. So he did, um, tooling work. He did, um, work at, uh, toy, toy store to assemble, you know, bikes, but he eventually got a job as a draftsman sort of looking at, you know, pulling from some of his engineering, uh, degrees to be part of an electrical engineering, uh, firm, basically drafting before they were, you know, there was no such thing as CADs. You did everything by, uh, on paper. Um, in the meantime, back in India, um, my youngest brother was born. My youngest brother was actually born, um, I believe five or six months after my father left. So he had never met him. Um, um, and my middle brother was two years old. So it was an interesting time because you can imagine I'm six, my middle brother's two, youngest brother's just born. And for about two years, my mom lived with um, my grandfather and um, raised raised us in India. Now, in India, it's a little easier to do, I think, because you've got an extended set of family. But it was challenging because I'm sure I wasn't the easiest six-year-old in that dynamic. Do you remember that time, Manish? I remember being a bit of a rule breaker. Um, no, when you were six, uh, at that when dad had gone away, what what was in your mind that what was going on? Yeah, I don't remember specifics. It's an interesting uh, question because I've often tried to go back in time and say, how did that affect me, right? I mean, um, not having your father around for a two-year period at that age between six and eight. So, you know, formative times. Um, 
uh, I'm sure I uh, rebelled. I have stark memories of skipping school and, you know, um, uh, breaking rules and sort of getting the appropriate level of um, uh, talking to and, and uh, you know, punishment, as you can imagine. But I don't have those those crystal clear emotions that you would think like that was I sad was I you know upset was I uh, I, I really don't okay uh, but grandparents were pretty involved oh yeah uh, I remember uh, grandfather um, my grandmother passed away um, well she was older actually I don't know exactly when she passed away but um, on my father's side um, early on um, um, and I'm having a hard time remembering the sequencing of events, but my grandfather was definitely involved and he was very with it, you know, um, uh, sort of traditional patriarch kind of grandfather who ran a stern ship and was very methodical and, um, and uh, probably rigid as well. So, uh, then uh, after those two years, did dad come back or what happened? Uh, yeah. So in May of 1981, um, we all, so my two brothers, myself and my mother, got on a plane and uh, bought our one-way ticket and went came to the U.S. And uh, there's another stark memory. I remember back then you could walk people right up to the plane, right, family and friends. So, um, and my middle brother was very much attached to my grandfather. Um, my youngest brother was only two years old, so he was being held. And I'm six, so I'm a bit, um, I wouldn't say traumatized, but it was sort of, I remember being sort of just following instruction because I was very much like, what's going on, right? Uh, my youngest brother, as we were, you know, walking down the tarmac, um, sorry, my middle brother, um, who was um, four at the time, was very much attached to my grandfather. And he went off running, and so we had to chase him down on the tarmac. Um, but um, but I remember then landing at um, a JFK, and then was sort of being like in a in a movie, right? Sort of. You know, hadn't seen my father in two years. Kind of recognized him. He, you know, he grown a mustache and looked like a traditional '70s kind of American Indian man. Uh, my youngest brother was terrified of him because he didn't know who he was, a stranger. And so, um, and that was, you know, that was sort of the start of our second chapter of my life, I guess. Uh. Were you insecure? Was there some trauma going on? Yeah, it's interesting. So I, the reason I, I uh, highlighted, you know, in India, I have memories of being um, vocal, um, being, like I said, a troublemaker, being um, comfortable in the environment. When I got here, I sort of regressed. I became very shy, very quiet. Um, and, uh, we, because we got here in May, they didn't put us in school. I joined after the summer. So I had the entire summer to acclimate. Um, but when they put me in, in third grade, you know, they really didn't know what to do with me. I was the first Indian person that had gone to the elementary school, spoke English, you know, as well as a third, um, Greater can coming from India. We came, I, you know, I went to an English medium school in India. I was never a grade student in India. Looking back at my grades, and you know, I, I think um, my lack of discipline sort of showed. Um, but um, so when I got here, I, you know, sort of quieted down, became very um, introverted in external environments for a long period of time. Why? Why? Why, Manish? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it was, you know, it was sort of those those events of having 
my father figure leave for a period of time, then to come into a very different environment, uh, look very different. And this isn't like moving to Southern California at the age of eight today. This was moving to uh, a small part of New England, you know, in the, in the 1980s, early 1980s. So very different. Um, I stuck out like a sore, thro- sore thumb. And our city, New Bedford, was 75% Portuguese. So it was very homogenous as well. Right. And so um, I did what every child in that, I guess, age group, age group would do. It just sort of protected myself through creating a bunch of shell layers around me. Your own world, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. But it sort of uh, set me up to be um, focused on studies, right? So I just focused on being uh, a student. I wouldn't say I was a stellar student, even elementary school. Um, But I had my gang, right? I had my, um, my village, right, between my two younger brothers. As they grew up, they became my natural buddies and play. We play together. Um, you know, we moved into this apartment community um, where we all lived together, um, and it was one of those where uh, the center was a bunch was a parking lot, and the apartments sort of dotted in a circle, and so all the kids just played in the center. So it was a very semi. It was a pretty safe environment. Um, and so, you know, we grew up in the, as a lower socioeconomic family. My father worked um, as a draftsman. My mother worked in um, as a cashier at various jobs. And, you know, we kind of worked our way through through those things over, over the course of a couple of years. Um, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then we moved into our first home was one of those duplexes that you see in New England, which is sort of one, you know, multi-layered house with uh, each layer having uh, an entire family structure, you know, kitchen, multiple bedrooms and things. Um, and uh, and so, uh, you know, that forced me to change schools, which was interesting because, you know, the school was very close to walking distance or very, you know, five minute walk from our house. Um, and, uh, you know, I spent, uh, formative years there. I started to now, uh, once I got to that school, I started to create separation between me and other students where I got added to the talented and gifted programs. Um, but still didn't have friends. Like I had acquaintances, but I really didn't have core friends. And most, most kids, like I have two young kids by the time they're in uh fifth and sixth grade have friends that they see regularly i didn't um why did you have a problem opening up uh what was the issue i think it was relatability um i just had a hard time relating and maybe it's a function of opening up as well but you know um i i just couldn't um yeah i think i had one foot maybe both feet still planted in India in the way I thought and the way I interacted. And because I had the comfort of my brothers, I sort of gravitated towards that was my safety net. That was my safety situation. Um, and, you know, the parents, Indian parents of that generation protected their kids. They said, you know, um, this is a foreign land. You're Indian. You're, you know, you're... Um, you know, things, these things are good, these things are bad. And, and so, um, it's still the sense of fear that I don't know if that served us well when we were young. How did your brothers take to the change? I mean, uh, you obviously it had, had a pretty serious impact on you, but how, how did your brothers take to that change? Yeah, I think they, you know, between, you know, being, um, uh, two years old and four years old, you, it's a little different. Um, you, my two-year-old brother, he went, um, he was at home. My four-year-old brother went to preschool. And so there was, there's, you know, at that age, things are changing so rapidly that I think they had an opportunity to assimilate, um, in stride for the most part. Um, so 
you can see it in the way they think, the way that they approach the world. They approach it very much like somebody born in the United States at that age. Right. And so, um, good and bad, right? So, yeah. But you don't. I don't. Because you're still an Ajmeri at heart. Is that what you're saying? I think um, I'm... And I, I don't mean it in a negative way. Ajmer is an amazing place. No, I, I think I think what it is is that, um, um, and my wife and I talk about this, right? Or let me give you an example. They say that the, the language that you learn and speak up until the age of five or six is how you think, right? And so, okay, that was for me mostly Hindi, a little bit of English. Now, can I, do I think in Hindi? I no longer think in Hindi, but I still have, it's interesting, I have trouble with certain idioms because they don't make sense in Hindi. And so um, that, that's an example of me having a hybrid way of thinking, right? So my values, how I see the world has really definitely been shaped from all of my experience in India. Um, so... Uh, I would just say that I, I think very much like a hybrid person. That's not atypical of somebody that spent their formative years in another country. Yeah. Nope. Very interesting. Um, uh, but while all of this was uh, going on, Dad's, dad was a draftsman and mom was uh, working retail at that time. And you saw all of uh, this, you know, I mean, they were working hard to make sure they could give you all three of your good uh, life, so to speak. Uh, what did you think about that? Did you observe any of that and said, hey, my parents, you know, my dad's making this sacrifice as mom is, uh, because mom's also a family maker. Uh, instead of homemaker, I call them family makers. Yeah. No, I like that term. You know, in hindsight, I think I have a much better appreciation. At the time, it felt like uh, we didn't have enough, right? So buying a toy, buying the new sneakers was a big deal, right? Buying a name brand jacket or clothes was a huge deal. It would be epic battles of, you know, why can't we have this? Um, and so it was a h hard to appreciate that the, the sacrifice though we saw them work constantly. Um, but again, I'd say in hindsight, uh, very much appreciate I never felt like we were missing anything. Maybe we didn't have the highest quality of things. Do you think dad should have come to America and left you guys back there? Have you ever thought of that? I've actually never even thought about that. Um, so would it have been easier for us if we all came together? I don't think so. I think they did it logically. Should he have waited a couple of years? Maybe. Should he have done it before? You know, I always look at my youngest brother who, you know, he's had an interesting relationship with dad wasn't there in the first couple of years. And so the, I'm sure that's, to, you know, created a, a different kind of relationship with him and each, each of my brothers, but I don't blame them or I don't say that they did, um, bad by us or, or negative. Um, I think, um, I think they had to do what they had to do. And I, I can't imagine today having the fortitude of leaving my family for like what it would take and what the circumstances would have to be. And that's what I think about is that the circumstances had to be dire enough for them to do this. Yeah. Because I grew up, yeah, I grew up with as, as a, uh, we were a family unit, you know, we were, we were, we were constantly together. We did everything together. You, mom, and the uh, two brothers, right? So then you shifted schools and um, uh, you went to a different school. Uh, was that better uh, in terms of socializing or it was still the same and uh, in terms of studies? Yeah, I think in terms of studies, it was better um, because I was able to, you know, I started to come into my own. And, um, you know, fifth and sixth grade is when you start to, see distinguished separation as well. Um, I think the neighborhood wasn't better. Um, 
I think the neighborhood was actually worse. Um, but um, maybe that's also why I was able to distinguish myself in, in some way. So, um, so those fifth and sixth grade um, time periods were pretty rapid. Um, right around that time, my grandfather moved to the U.S. as well. So, um, yeah, because at the time, um, you know, uh, my youngest, um, uh, Hua got married. So at that point he's, his job as a, um, patriarch were done, was done. So his natural place was beside his son. So he moved to the U S with us, which was great. So we had, you know, a, a connection to that generation. So we played rummy and carom and all those things together with him um, growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Rummy. Uh, who was winning in rummy generally him or you? Because I played a lot of rummy with my dad and my grandfather, but I was on the losing side usually. No, I was, I was usually yeah. on the, on the losing side. My middle brother seemed to have done pretty well on, on those games. Wow. So uh, granddad moved here and then uh, things, you know, you had a little more activity because mom and dad were generally out working and grandfather was probably a little bit more at home to provide that, uh, you know, emotional support. So th things got a little bit better. And then uh, you were in the GT program in the fifth and the sixth grade, you know, gifted and talented. And then uh, how... Uh, did it progress from there, Manish? It did. Um, and, you know, like I said, I started to hit my stride in seventh and eighth grade. I would say I sort of formed, um, started to see glimmers of the person that I was meant to be. And again, this is retrospective, right? Um, uh, created what are lifelong relationships. I found partners um, and friends in, 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 in middle school that were like-minded also were, you know, what quote unquote smarter kids and, um, had the right values, um, discovered skateboarding, um, and biking. Um, and, uh, and so I ended up in middle school, you know, being valedictorian of a middle school. And then in high school, um, you know, that was friendships continued. So we started to build, uh, sometimes middle school to high school friendships break, but, um, they continued. And, um, uh, you know, again, now it's a bigger, uh, I went to a school that had, um, my class had, um, uh, almost 500 kids in, in my grade, 2000 kids total. And, um, and so it was a large school with now the entire cities, uh, uh, people coming into the school, the students coming in there. And um, um, so now the competition was much higher, you know, but I always found myself in the top 10, maybe not the top number one. Um, and I discovered drama. So I was part of drama club, played soccer for several years, played tennis. So I just started to find my rhythm and, uh, and relationships um, that I was sorely lacking, right? So until middle school, I didn't have an attachment to my local society, but middle school created that opportunity and then high school, it just blew open. And um, so you came out of your shell that you had gone into? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, pretty awesome. So you were doing pretty good. You were in the top 10, give or take. And you were involved in sports, skateboarding. Skateboarding is a pretty cool sport. Uh, you know, people love skateboarders and other sports. And then uh, you built some good friends also at that time. Yeah. You know, being part of the soccer team, you, you build camaraderie. Um, being part of the tennis team, you build camaraderie. Um, um, drama club was a passion where we would spend... You know, you spend all day in school, a couple hours in sports, and then drama club was in the evening. So I was at school for 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, uh, I didn't find high school terribly hard academically. Um, and so 
you know, I was able to do all those activities. And um, as part of those, we got a chance to travel. Um, you know, we went to Broadway to see plays. We went to other parts of the state to, you know, interact with others. Um, I also did a bit of cross, cross country as well. So uh, all in all, you know, I just started to fill out my experience set, right? If, if you can, you know, if you can share anything about life with your, your kids or um, the next generation, it's about filling your life with experiences because that's how you enrich it. And so that's what I was starting to do unknowingly. That's a great point uh, for our listeners is uh, fill your life with experiences, with people, friends, et cetera, right? Is that what you're saying, Manish? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Um, and do you think sports is a big part of those experiences? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, it teaches you humility. It teaches you to get up when you've fallen down. It teaches you grit. I mean, if you don't practice, you don't get better. It teaches you a sense that you're not going to be the best at something, right? There's only a handful of people that have no limit in sports. Most people reach a limit. So you have to appreciate who you are and live within the confines of you yourself, right? Sort of a perfect metaphor for what, what eventually life is going to bring to you. Right. And so, um, and so I, I think sports is a, an absolute must. Well, that's uh, great to know. So then, uh, you finished high school, um, uh, Manish. Uh, so what happened after that? Yeah, so, you know, parents wanted me to be an engineer, doctor, or lawyer. What else is there? Um, it's called uh, the two-profession rule for Indians, doctors or engineers. That's, that's all we've got. The two-profession rule, the two-grade rule, A plus or A. Yeah. Nothing yeah. else is uh, acceptable. <laughs> so, um, you know, being, uh, like I said, I think, you know, I did fairly well in, in school. I did you know, okay on my standardized tests, um, did pretty well in academics, but the school's not well known. It's sort of a, you know, a, a large public school in a, in an okay part of the country. Uh, fun fact, New Bedford was known. Um, so if you've ever read Moby Dick, um, Ahab leaves out of New Bedford Harbor. So there's actually a whaling museum inside of, in New Bedford. So, you know, you can see a, what the town is really known for its fishing industry, uh, Titleist is headquartered there, nothing else, right? That's it. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I got into, I'd say my, my second tier schools had to apply to MIT, had to apply to all the organizations that, um, schools that had an engineering degree. And, and I was starting to go towards engineering because I had an aptitude for science and math. Um, and, uh, you know, I got into, um, uh, a couple of schools and, uh, ultimately decided to, uh, go to a, uh, technology focused school, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. It's a, you know, a engineering focused school just outside of Boston and Worcester, um, started out as a chemistry, uh, chemistry major, chem, chem -eng major, uh, quickly figured out that, um, spending the rest of my life in a lab was not something I wanted to do. Um, so I switched into electrical engineering. Um, and, uh, again, I was, you know, starting to find my stride. Um, but I hit, I hit a hiccup in freshman year in college, the game changed my high school. Like I said, I coasted through, um, college, I hit these expectations that were completely different. More importantly, I was no longer living in the, under the rules of my parents. And so sort of that, that liver, you know, liberty, the, the freedom that comes with it, uh, created a, um, a learning opportunity for me, I think. And so, um, the first couple of quarters were rough, um, just from grades and lack of focus. And, um, and so I, you know, uh, eventually got my act together after freshman year, um, still ended up with a really good situation. But my junior year, as I started to look forward to what I wanted to do, um, I found biology as an interesting 
subject. So I actually applied um, to the bachelor's master's program. And so I switched into a master's program my last year of school. And there's several things in my life that sort of I couldn't plan that just happened somewhat randomly that if I hadn't, if I flipped the coin the other way, I think I'd be in a very different situation. Like what? Because those are the things we want our listeners to know. Yeah. So uh, I finished my, after my first four years of undergrad, I finished one year of my master's because it was a combined program. And my master's um, thesis advisor said, you know, you might want to go to a PhD program in biomedical instrumentation. This was in the mid nineties. And so digital radiography was starting to become a real thing. So instead of film, you put it on the screen. Um, so I applied to, uh, to a bunch of schools, got into UPenn uh, for a PhD program. Wow. Ivy League. Yeah. And it was a you know, great program, but I have, uh, I'd start to incur some real dollars because that's a, you know, expensive program. Um, and, uh, and I knew my, my young, my middle brother was now going to college. Um, and he had gotten into um, Columbia, so another private school that requires expensive, right? And so, you know, those things were in my mind because it's not like I could foot my own bill at the time. And uh, so I knew it was going to be a burden on my parents. And um, and my youngest brother was two years behind there. So, you know, those things are sort of uh, top of mind. Um, so I was sitting there a week before graduation when I got a call from a recruiter in Southern California. And this is sort of the, one of those things that you couldn't plan. Uh, my resume happened to be in our resume book and they said, come out and interview with us. So I said, free trip to Southern California. Sure. Um, really no, I had no intention of taking the job and uh, came out and uh, fell, fell in love with the opportunity. They would pay for my master. So I would finish my master's at USC I would work at the same time. And uh, so my thought was defer my PhD for a couple of years and um, and come and do my master's so I get one year of education paid for by this organization. And then I have to serve one year of work after that. Right? Sort of logical if you think about it. Well, I finished my master's in a year at USC and... Um, and uh, so I had to serve the rest of my term with with the defense contractor. TRW was the name of the company. El Segundo. Yeah, and at the and now we're talking mid nineties, so uh, Napster, um, Netscape, Yahoo. Right, the world had changed, and I'm looking and saying, wait, wait is this really something? Should I pursue this thing called, you know, digital radiography and spend four years? Didn't feel right. So I started interviewing um, and another moment in life where I'm sitting at an interview with, in uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey at Lucent Labs, brand name, right? Indians gravitate towards brand names. And uh, the uh, I was going to be the fiber to the home expert. My salary would be doubled. I would have a cushy title. And, um, and I started talking and I said, what about cop, uh, copper? What about cable? And the gentleman, the hiring director said, yeah, there's a company by, by your neck of the woods that's doing something somewhere. He mentioned those words. I didn't even bait him on that. Well, that company was started by uh, half my team members went to start that company at TRW. And I discounted it because I'm like, I need to move back east. My parents are said, you know, two years, you're out on the West Coast alone. You have to move back. So, you know, I did the smart thing there or lucky thing and said, well, maybe I should interview with that company. Um, so I did. Um, and the, the second life lesson that I've learned is always when you're starting out in any role, always, or really in generally any situation, don't be the smartest person in the room. Always surround yourself with people that are much smarter than you. And in this company, two thirds of the people were PhDs. I was the only one of the junior masters people. 
um, just rock stars. And the interview process was eight hours of just bashing. So you wanted to work for the company. Long story short, that company is Broadcom Corporation. I was employee um, um, 60 when I joined. Uh, we went public uh, eight months after I joined. And, um, and so I was at the right place at the right time and um, spent seven years helping, helping to build chips that are today are in probably every household in, in the United States and many, many households across the world. Um, so it was a really great learning experience on how to be efficient, how to scale quickly, how to um, uh, just be uh, maniacal about customer service and, and listen to the market. Um, uh, but it was a great experience. So couple of life lessons because you know this is part of what the show is about is don't be uh, the smartest person in the room try to always look for other smart surround yourself with smarter people but also you took a chance because you know Lucent at that time was a big name and you would have been closer to your parents uh, you know New Jersey Boston etc but you said let me talk to these folks and uh, at that time Broadcom was just a, what we call it a startup right now. That's what it was, right? Yeah, sixty people, early early revenue, you know, high risk, right? And and remember, these were all TRW folks. I didn't know Broadcom was mainly all ex TRW folks. Yeah, so Henry Samueli and and um, Henry Nicholas both were at TRW. They were in the same building uh, prior to me getting there. Um, uh, Henry Samueli was a UCLA professor. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of people. In fact, we uh, had had some conflicts with TRW for obvious reasons. Of course, IP and all that other stuff, I'm sure. Yeah, but let's not go there. Uh, so then Broadcom uh, went IPO and uh, stuff like that. Then what happened? Uh, that was six years of amazing learn learning lessons for you. Yeah. So uh, all of a sudden, I became independently wealthy. Right, so didn't buy, and uh, and then obviously the market crashed, and and a lot of that went away. Right, um, easy come, easy go, Manish. Right, right, and and so you know, those are also lessons learned. Right, so capture your value when you can. Um, but I knew that engineering was not something I wanted to do long term. I wanted to be closer to the customer, and and Broadcom was not the right the environment for me to be there. So. I decided let's go back to go get a degree business school. So I had the luxury of quitting my job and spending two years to re-educate myself in my um, late twenties. So yeah, I, I went to UCLA and um, discovered venture capital. Um, and um, and UCLA, I didn't even realize had a program until I got there around um, a fellows program. They select four to five people highly competitive. So I was able to get in. And so I did a, an internship on Sandell Road, spent the summer, um, you know, learning. And, uh, and then I came back and uh, joined a venture firm in Orange County. So what's interesting, I did my, I spent a long time in, in Orange County, in Irvine at Broadcom. And then after business school, I ended up in Orange County in Newport Beach. Um, so was great. I, you know, I couldn't write the script better. I joined as an associate with the uh, three partners that were lawyers and one partner that was a scientist. And, um, and, uh, really I was part of their succession plan. So I went from associate to partner in five years, um, really crafting the strategy for healthcare. This was around the high tech act was passed and ACA. And, you know, I recognized quickly that we were a small fund. We were an $80 million fund that you're competing in a commodity world. You, know, you might think you're the smartest person in the room, but at the end of the day, you're a commodity. Only your hypothesis and your thesis and access to deal flow were your differentiator. So I said, I'm gonna make a go at this thing called healthcare IT. At the time, there were only two pure play healthcare IT investors in the country. If you can believe that, this was 2011, uh, 2008. So I said, two. Yeah. So, and my, and my partners at Miramar Venture Partners let me 
dabble and and uh, so they trusted me so we made several investments um and um and i felt strongly that we needed to have a thesis focused strategy so i left and said i'm going to raise my own fund i got an anchor investor got us to you know 17 million dollars in committed capital of a hundred million dollar fund and spent a year of my life learning a lesson that it is really hard to raise capital in 2011 on a healthcare strategy. Um, but I think today I'm stronger because of it, because it taught me a lot of humility and, a, and an understanding that I wasn't ready for it at the time. Um, so I actually joined one of the companies I was on the board of prior to my leaving my other fund. And the chairman jumped in as CEO. So these two board members then took that company in. And so it was an interesting company. It was a healthcare technology company servicing consumers. And, uh, and we took that company over a course of seven years from a million dollars to a hundred million dollars in revenue. Um, I was put in charge of all deals. So I did acquisitions. We did seven acquisitions. I'd never done an acquisition until I got there. Um, I let all capital raises because I spoke the language of the investor as well as investment community. So it was easy for me to uh, pitch the story. We raised a quarter billion dollars from some of the best funds in the country. And, uh, you know, we grew this business. Um, Eventually, I got operational roles. So I was head of integration, so post merger integration, uh, head of product and solutions. Really, it was being set up to be the next COO of the company with the logical path to be CEO. But I was burned out. Right, the company. You know, after seven years, you just you you know when it's time to hand the reins to someone else. And um, so I stepped out and was really not actively looking, but I got a call from a recruiter um, that was looking to fill a role at, at Mayo. And the recruiter um, said, you know, you're, you're exactly the kind of person that Mayo needs because they're developing this platform strategy. There's a new CEO. And I kind of chuckled. I said, you know, my first company if you exclude TRW for a second, first company I was employee 60, second company I was employee four, my last company I was employee 14. How does this make any sense on paper? Um, but it's Mayo Clinic, so I took the interview. And if you've ever been to Mayo or interacted with Mayo, it, it's a special place. You fall in love with the mission, you fall in love with the methodology. And I fell in love. So I said, I'll give it a shot. I'll help you write the strategy. So I joined. So I took, here's a second lesson or where, whatever number we're on. I, I, I took a lower role, right? I had a C-level role, arguably at a startup. Um, so I took a, what's a, called a vice chair role, the equivalent to like a VP in corporate development. So I went from an operational role to a transactional role. I said, I'll do this because I want to, I want to hear what, what they're, what they're all about. I want to help shape something that's different. I, up until that point, my healthcare experience was in diagnostics, was in, uh, wellness and prevention and Mayo Clinic is really at the opposite of the spectrum. It's really tertiary care and, and complex care. But I said, I learned something in a short-term process and again, fell in love with the organization. And, um, and after we wrote the strategy, um, they brought in Dr. John Halemka to be, um, to be the president of this new business unit called Mayo Clinic Platform. And at the time, my, our CAO, chief administrative officer and our CEO said, put your name in the hat for COO and Mayo, everything operates in a dyad model. So physician and administrative partner. Um, so I said, okay. Um, and, uh, you know, they gave me the job and now here I am. And I look back at my career and say, I am very comfortable in technology. I'm very comfortable on cap table and governance model. I'm very comfortable at the healthcare technology landscape. 
my entire career was built so I could do this role. And, uh, but I couldn't plan it that way. Right. And so, um, you know, I would, I would say I'm in a dream job. I've been in this role for three years. We are, I can say we're impacting tens of millions of lives and everything we're doing. And, um, and, you know, I approach it with a sense of humility because uh, a lot of people uh, gave me a chance and took a risk um, where on paper it really doesn't make sense. Manish, for our listeners, can you explain what platform is? Uh, because, you know, you use that term. I, uh, so just, just a brief explanation what Mayo platform is. Yeah. Um, so today, healthcare is a bunch of proprietary things, right? Proprietary data sources, proprietary patient populations. So everybody's got their little fiefdom that they're protecting. And what we like to do is to break that apart so the shared learning of physicians and multiple practices can be shared so that next patient that, that any participating physician sees, they get the benefit of all the patients that are seen, right? So you make better collective decisions. So how do you do that? You have to break data boundaries. You have to be willing to share your data. You have to do this in a patient privacy protected manner. And you have to be willing to um, engage and share your knowledge. So what we've done is created a true global federated data network. So Mayo data next to other high quality institutions. And we made it available to innovators so they can create innovation for any particular kind of disease area or uh, clinical area. Uh, and that's a global venture. And then uh, we're enabling physicians to, and health systems to participate in that. So um, instead of picking a bunch of point solutions for any particular problem they have, they can um, connect into this thing called Mayo Clinic Platform and get some of the best, the, the experience of the best minds across the globe, right? And so the 10 million patients that Mayo has seen are some of the sickest patients and most complex patients. And if you can start to create care models and clinical decision tools based on all of that history, the output of that will be better than any single patient, uh, any single physician's experience. So that's healthcare. That's our platform. We're a business unit inside of Mayo Clinic. And I presume AI is going to play a key role also in going forward into this. So that data infrastructure allows you to do really anything. You can test care models, you can create algorithms, you can create um, insights. So the idea is to remove, so if you think about healthcare innovation, the challenge is I need access to information, I need access to data. So we've now changed that paradigm. Um, the second thing is you need access to tools. So we've created those. The last, you need access to actual end users. Those are the physicians, nurses, administrators. So we've also simplified that. So you can take this value chain that usually consists of 18 months to get access to data, a year to two years to develop the tools, a year to negotiate a contract to implement. So your sales cycle or your implementation cycle is three years. So we've reduced that to six months. So why that's interesting is now any innovator across the globe can create innovation. And that's how we're going to transform healthcare to make it cheaper. And more accessible, probably. Well, that's exactly right. One of our, one of the projects I know we're at time, but I, one of the projects I'm most proud of is pre pandemic. We said, let's change what the word hospital means. Can we take care of patients in their home? as if they were in a hospital. So instead of going from the emergency room to a bed for two days, could we take you from the emergency room, send you home, but you get all the things as if you were in the hospital bed. So nutrition, medicine, diagnostics, 24 access, 24 seven access to a physician in your home with high reliability. Well, that's a much better patient experience and then this thing called COVID came along that was, it sort of 
forced everybody to think outside and think um, think about how to get patients out of a hospital. So it accelerated this. So with this concept of hospital at home, been around, but we, Mayo Clinic and our partnership with Kaiser, we accelerated this thing. And why I'm mentioning that is that's innovation. That's actually patient-centric. It's actually, uh, and it's, we know it's safer we, because of hospital-borne illnesses. Uh, we know it's cheaper and we know patients love it, right? So that's a simple example of some of the things we're working on. Oh, fantastic. Uh, we are lucky to have that. Uh, Manish, just, uh, you touched on a couple of things. I want to just address that because we asked that to everybody because as moving forward, have mentors played a role uh, in your life at all? And I'm talking informal, formal. You know, mentors come in different shapes, sizes, et cetera. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Some people are really good at um, creating a mentor um, model. I think I've relied upon informal learnings from my conversations with people. So one thing that I would say that happened to me after um, leaving my engineering world and business school is I've had an opportunity to engage with thousands of people in in my normal day-to-day -day life because as a venture capitalist, you, you see hundreds of companies you know, a month um, as a deal maker in an m a role you see a lot of deals um and you engage with a lot of different kinds of people and in my current role engage i've engaged with a lot of different kind of people so i would say i've never had a formal mentor but i can tell you what i learned from every um one of my supervisors and and um and uh colleagues along the way and all the conversations I tend to be, I think if I have any skill that I'm proud of is that I'm good at distilling some nugget of information from every conversation and, and really taking it and having it, inserting it in my core being. So it becomes part of me. Um, so it's not like I'm relying upon one or two people. That's fantastic. So basically taking some value out of every conversation and that's a message uh, to our listeners. Manish, you've had an incredible uh, journey so far, and obviously there's so much more to go. And, you know, given the world we are in today, it's a kind of, where do you see the journey going from now? I mean, you know, nobody can predict 20 years, even 10 years from now, but if you were to look a little bit towards the future, um, you know, a kid from Ajmer, uh, from Bedford, now at Mayo, uh, where, where does that uh, kid go? So I'm starting to lay the groundwork for when um, when I can have more scalable impact. Um, so thinking about um, not-for-profit board work, uh, leveraging the sort of the the great relationships I've had the fortune of of, of creating over the last um, thirty years of my career. Um, so, you know, starting to think about foundations, starting to think about organizations I want to be part of, because those things I think to create truly trusted relationships take five to 10 years. Um, so th that's my hope. Um, I'm not done. You know, I'm early fifties. I've got- You've just begun. A couple of decades still left in me. And, and frankly, you know, as my wife says, if you're not actively working, you're, you're, um, uh, Kind of annoying. Um, and so, um, so, you know, um, I think, I think, you know, my hope is that this is my last full time job, but if it isn't, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of problems in healthcare and, um, and I, you know, feel like I'm just starting to understand how all these pieces fit together. Great. I think we're lucky to have someone like you solving our healthcare issues. Manish, uh, we asked you to look forward. Just if you can just take a brief look back, just pretend I'm uh, Manish uh, coming out of Bedford. What would be the one or two things, knowing where you are today, that you would be uh, giving as advice to the Manish coming out of Bedford, let's just say out of the engineering college that you had? Oh, gosh, uh, two things. One, 
everything eventually works out. Um, because you've got a, um, you've got a commitment to doing the work to believe in yourself. Right. I would say that the lasting impact that I still struggle with every now and then, um, that I think moving from India to the U.S. had was this uh, discomfort in my own abilities or lack of belief that I could do something or was sufficiently, um, uh, uh, you know, that, that feeling like you, you know, the emperor's got no clothes, right? It's sort of that belief that, am I right for this role or, you know, what, what, and, and so um, just telling myself that this, You've earned the right to be wherever you are, but you still have to prove yourself, right? And so um, it's sort of a little bit of empathy with a little bit of com confidence. That's great. So everything is going to work out, but also a little bit of empathy and a little bit of confidence. Uh, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, Manish, uh, we always ask our guests at the end just a quick lightning questions. Uh, your definition uh, briefly about Indianness. So it's an interesting question. So I would say um, what's great about our culture, as I see it, um, we have a respect for meritocracy. And, and I generally believe that, like the merits of the argument outweigh who's delivering it. Um, and it's a naive statement in many ways. I understand that that's not how the world works, but I think it's part of why we as an, we as a, um, a subculture or culture are where we are. Right. And I think that comes with, that's both good and bad. Um, so I think that's an important, uh, definition or part of what being Indianist or what Indianist means. Um, I think the second part of it is, um, this relentless, you know, what was the slogan? Um, it was a car manufacturer, the relentless pursuit of excellence. Yeah. Right. Um, it's just in me. I, I just, I give it all. I don't, you know, whether I'm a dad, whether I'm a husband, whether I'm a, uh, COO, whatever it is, like pour everything into it. That's just who I am. And I think that's true for who Indianness is for me. Great uh, feedback. Relentless pursuit of excellence and belief in meritocracy. So that's fantastic. Last uh, one, uh, a person, not your family, alive from India or outside India of Indian origin that inspires you or you admire, one or two at the max. We ask this all. We ask this to everybody, too. By the way, so um, I was part of this Indian uh, networking organization in the '90s. I'm forgetting the name of it now, um, but they held a conference, and they um, I don't remember. I don't think it was Thai, but um, a gentleman by the name of Sashi Tharoor um, gave a presentation. And up until that point, my impression of leaders of Indian origin tended to be very much, um, they were either very Indian and could not assimilate a, a Western discussion or were so Western that they couldn't assimilate. And he, for the first time, connected the dots for me, uh, read his book and um, you know, midnight to millennium and kind of gave me this sense that these things are really connectable. Now I've never met him. I don't know that, uh, ever have a chance or will ever have a chance, but I would say that was an interesting person because it was sort of a, well, you can really do both. Yeah. Uh, he's one of the most articulate that you'll meet. He's a member of parliament in India now. Uh, he used to be at the UN and, uh, yeah, but great choice. Great choice. Uh, Manish, thank you so much. There's some amazing life lessons and, you know, a lot to learn for our listeners. Thank you for sharing. I think that's the most important thing that I would have to say. Uh, 
and really, really appreciate you taking the time. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, this was fun for me because I haven't actually relived some of those memories uh, in a long time, but appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.